Hey climbers, welcome back to Climb by BSC, a weekly show about building and scaling startups in the world of climate innovation. My name is Jacob Poor, general partner of VSC Ventures and co-host of Climb. Every week, I or a member of our VSC team will speak with a pioneer in the climate tech world about emerging technologies and novel ideas that will turn the tide on climate change. We've all heard enough of the doom and gloom. It's time for stories of purpose-driven innovation that lead to sustainable, positive change. As always, I'm so happy that you've decided to join us. Now let's climb. Heather Clancy is an award-winning journalist specializing in transformative technology and innovation. She started her reporting career on the business news desk of United Press International, and her articles have appeared in Entrepreneur, Fortune, the International Herald Tribune, and the New York Times. Heather was the launch editor for the Fortune Datasheet, the magazine's newsletter dedicated to the business of technology, and she co-authored the Amazon bestseller for entrepreneurs, Niche Down, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. In her role at GreenBiz, Heather chronicles the role of business model innovation and technology in enabling corporate climate action and transitioning to a clean, inclusive, and regenerative economy. It's my pleasure to welcome Heather Clancy to Climb. Hi, Heather. How are you today? I am great. I hope you are as well. Yeah, doing well. It's a nice day out uh, here in uh, North Carolina, so all, all is good. Let's start off by um, having you tell us a little bit about your career journey and what led you to focus on sustainability. Yes. So I got laid off. <laughs> I was in a, I was a career uh, journalist focused on, on business and uh, technology and was working for a trade uh, in the early uh, 2000s and uh, had started dabbling with coverage of things like electronic waste and how it pertained to the industry, as well as data center efficiency and other green technologies. And when I was laid off, uh, someone called me from a, a, a mainstream digital news site and said, hey, we, we, we know you're available. What do you want to write about? And I said, green tech immediately. Like I just knew that that was going to be what I wanted to write about. So I started writing focused predominantly on on how the computer industry was cleaning up its act or not, as, as the case was, maybe. And so I kind of evolved from there into um, broader issues of, of how, you know, the clean tech movement as well. Um, and, but that's how I got started. I got pushed off the cliff and, and just, I felt that, that this was the place where I mm -hmm. wanted to spend my time doing research and reporting and really understanding how technology could play a role in addressing climate change. Now, today, there's plenty of uh, reporters on the beat who are covering this sort of thing. When you first got into it, was it um, kind of new territory or was there already a well-established kind of beat for, for green tech? No, there really wasn't a beat. It was very green field. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, I came in from the information technology world from that industry's point of view. And then I started looking at other industries and how they were adapting their applied technologies and, and, and so forth in order to do things like save water and uh, reduce the energy consumption of their manufacturing operations. But there wasn't really anyone reporting on this because um, unless it was an, a money saving, uh, you know, move, it wasn't really that interesting to the businesses that the companies at the time, they, they weren't really buying, they got the efficiency angle. And that that's kind of the way I was approaching it a lot in my early reporting days. But they weren't buying the whole notion that they should be uh, doing this because it might ha be having a broader impact on, on the planet. Right. So tell us now how you got to GreenBiz, what your role is at GreenBiz and how you got there and maybe a little bit about the mission of GreenBiz. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of myself as the editor at large for GreenBiz. So I, I write about a lot of different things. I started as a freelancer. I've been working with the organization for about, I guess it's 11 years now. And I uh, was just, you know, contributing a lot of different stories. And, and this is something I've always liked doing, which is sort of seeing a, a trend early on and just kind of exploring what it means and, um, and seeing it go mainstream and seeing it evolve and kind of sticking with it. And so I, I reported early on the whole uh, renewable energy procurement uh, process and how corporations were going out and, and helping support solar farms and wind farms in service of their their goals and in terms of you know trying to deal with their carbon emissions from their operations so that's how i got involved over time I, my involvement became 
you know, to what it is today, which, which is where I'm a full-time staffer. Green Biz is a media organization that is serves communities that that are addressing the climate crisis, right? So they are, there's corporate sustainability professionals, of course, but there's also product designers who are making uh, things more circular so that you can take them apart and, and take the components and put them back into circulation. There's the finance community that is is fun, uh, funding and finding the money to to invest in wind farms, to invest in emerging markets where there might be um, a solution for, uh, as an example, a mangrove forest that could help, um, you know, sequester more carbon. And then also we are um, really focused on the climate tech community. So the climate tech startups, the the, the venture capitalists, like, you know, the v- VSC. Um, and so we we sort of serve all those communities and, and we have predominantly events. So we, we organize these communities at events and also in peer networks. My part of the operation is focused on continuing that dialogue, the dialogue that we have at our events on uh, the, the website and also in a, a portfolio of newsletters. We currently have seven of them and are in, uh, looking at adding more. Wow. So, you know, it's exciting to hear how you're seeing corporate America talk about it now and, and how that allows you guys to do what you do. Over the last decade or so, I'm sure there's been a significant change in the discourse around sustainability. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and what you've seen from maybe where it was, like I said, a decade ago to where it is today? Yeah. The primary change in the discourse is that at the at the beginning of the movement, it was sort of these voices on the sustainability team that were, uh, I want, I don't want to say shouting in, in the, you know, in the darkness, but, right. but the, they were off, they, they, you know, they didn't have a lot of authority. Uh, the, the chief sustainability officers, if there were any at, at a particular company, um, maybe they reported to the CEO, but maybe more often than not, they reported to um, some kind of communications function so that a company could talk about what it was doing over time. And this is the important thing. Um, the, this discourse has, has moved into the boardroom, into the C-suite, and these or these teams are now collaborating with teams across the company. So if you're working on a circular economy solution for a company, who's going to be involved in that? Well, it's the, it's the supply chain. It's the designers. It's the people that are sourcing the materials. The big difference is that these notions and these business practices are being embedded into the operating practices of companies. And one of the most fascinating things I see happening right now is the the role of data. And, uh, you know, you, you would never see a company run its finance organization or main, main operations or accounting systems off of estimates and so forth. But right now, a lot of companies rely on estimates about carbon emissions and water consumption and so forth. There's lots of averages that are used. That's important, and it's an important first step. But I, th- what I'm really um, excited to see is how this sort of carbon accounting uh, and and accounting for all these other things is moving into the mainstream operations of companies. It's really becoming embedded in the systems and the operations. Yeah, where else have you seen maybe some exciting innovations? You talk now, you know, there about the accounting side of things, the economic side of things, but you also mentioned supply chain. Um, where are other areas where you're seeing um, sustainability is starting to have more of an impact for companies. So we do see companies making processes or adopting uh, rules and regulations that require that their partners have some kind of targets themselves. So we see that that's happening more and more often. So one great example is Project Gigaton at Walmart. So this is a huge initiative that they've put in place to get their supply chain partners, to get the people making the products that they sell the, the people that provide energy to actually have their own goals. So, you know, when you talk about emissions, you have the scope one, which is what, you know, your company can address right right out of the gate. Scope two being the sort of main things like energy and so forth that are purchases and, and that you're dealing with um, as an operation. But then there's that scope three, which is the upstream and downstream impact of of the products you make and where you source them. So, what we see is is a lot more um, innovation there and innovation in, tra- in traceability. Um, that's an important part of it. And that kind of goes back to the data comment that I was having that I mentioned before. Um, I'm also really interested in some of the um, and when you look at climate tech writ large, 
there's lots of different sort of subsectors of it. I am particularly interested in the industrial climate tech. So the, the things that really help with the actual decarbonization of a process in the, in the factory, right? So a new material that can actually reduce the emissions of, of a product, a, a new system or approach, robotics approach, as an example, that can take apart a product and, and make it reusable in, in a more a seamless way. Product design. So designing in what what's called digital twins, where you can sort of model the scenarios, if you will, of a product in the virtual world, and then you know, decide what what decisions to make, sort of change variables and, and see how that will impact things. So that's some of the exciting places I'm seeing innovation right now. Yeah, it's really great to hear that, you know, there are, it is permeating across a wide range of verticals. Uh, and it's not just, as you said earlier, it's not just like, well, what can the communications department talk about? It really is uh, starting to have a touch uh, across the board there. Let's talk about climate change for a second. You know, here in North Carolina, it's February or it's just uh, now March uh, here in North Carolina. And believe it or not, we've already entered pollen season, probably four to six weeks earlier than normal here. So, you know, we're seeing the effects of climate change, not just in fires or tornadoes or things like that, but in small things like pollen season. But what gives you optimism? Uh, in the fight against climate change. I'm sure you're, you know, obviously seeing news that can that sometimes be disheartening, but you're probably seeing optimistic uh, news as well. One of the things that makes me optimistic is how involved the youth of today is, um, how much they care, how passionate they are, how much they want to learn about this in the college level and the high school level. The intelligence and the maturity of young people today about this issue is just astonishing to me. I, I, when I, I get embarrassed when I think about what the things I was thinking about as a senior in high school, um, it's sad that the young generation has to think about this, but I am so excited that they are because um, it is, you know, as a climate journalist, it is kind of depressing sometimes, you know, you, you read these stories, you're thinking about your own stories. What am I writing? You're trying to make sure that you don't, contribute to greenwash and it can be frustrating to figure figure out what stories to cover because you want to cover the you want to cover the important stories but you also don't want to overblow something that you know isn't really um all it seems and that's really easy to do in my beat in particular because I'm I'm writing about technology but the passion of young people today and and their um willingness to speak out about it right and their willingness to push really makes me um, optimistic. You know, you're in communications, but you're looking at the world of technology as it relates to, to the climate. What advice would you give young entrepreneurs that want to get into the climate tech space? Yeah. So I would, I would say to look at the mistakes of your elders, <laughs> see <laughs> what went wrong. Don't, don't replicate those mistakes. We don't have time for that. So, so I know that, um, you have a lot of good ideas and that and you should be putting them to use and to into practice as quickly as you can but i think that that um we need an intergenerational conversation to happen here i think that you should understand that there's a lot of wise people that have been around and they're not all jaded and they probably have a lot of good um advice for you and they're also hungry for advice from you, like you can, you can get advice from them, but they can also get advice from you. So they, they're wanting to listen. A lot of the, 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 the good people are, are willing to listen and want to hear what you have to say, because it's going to help them do their job better. They want, they want to do right by the next generation. So I would say that would be one thing. I would also say to be um, always thinking about the application of your technology. You need to understand how it's going to be applied you need to understand how the person that you're you're pitching it to would use it or would interact with it, um, and you, you need to spend you do need to spend time understanding your audience. Um, I think a lot of times people will just kind of pitch this great idea, and they don't really you know if they're pitching it to um, let's just say a corporation, they need to be able to talk about how that corporation might be able to replace a the process. They also need to understand the cost of doing so, right? You do need to have those numbers. You do need to understand the, the model, which goes back to, to point A, which is talk to people that know that. Um, 
I, I do also think that uh, when you talk about the climate tech entrepreneurs and the startups, I know that the sort of traditional venture capital world is probably the first place that you think to start, but there are a lot of corporate incubators and co corporate venture funds that um, you know have have the wherewithal to support your your uh, your your pro pro pilots and and initial projects, and you should look at that because they're going to be able to show you what your customers want. They're going to be able to test some of your customer premises. And so they will allow you to get the practical kind of experience that will then allow you to go back out to other fundraisers and get more money. So making sure that you understand how, how your product is going to be used is really important. And then getting the proof cases for that is um, vital. Great, that's really good advice. Um, I wanna talk a little bit now about GreenBiz. Uh, in the intro, you talked a little bit about some of the things that are going on there. Uh, I'd love to hear some of the key events that you guys have coming up, maybe, that you're looking forward to. Yeah, and I'm glad you didn't say favorite, because that's like asking what your favorite child is, you know, <laughs> like, who's your favorite kid? Um, yeah, so <laughs> we just had our uh, sellout Green Biz 23, which is the sort of the flagship event of the, of the company, focused predominantly on the corporate sustainability profession itself. So lots of career sessions, um, things that are sort of core to that, to that um, person's role. What we have coming up next are uh, in June are two conferences. One is called Circularity, and that is focused on all of the design and business model and financial uh, and innovation considerations that have to do with making a circular economy possible. So that's um, a, an event that I'm really excited about. I just love the, you know, sustainability includes the circular economy um, and and that that sort of new way of doing things, that new way of thinking about production is, is super important. The other event we have in June is called Greenfin, and it's it's focused on the finance community. Who's who's uh, you know helping finance this stuff? Where's the money going? What is the financial services industry doing with respect to how you know? There's going to be a lot of focus, I think, this year on how what they shouldn't be supporting, right? So we know there's been a lot of pressure and, and um, sort of scrutiny of what is funded. But, you know, how do we make this transition? What kind of finance do we make, need to make the transition? Where is that going to come from? What can we expect in terms of regulations? That's the sort of main focus of that event. And then finally, the event that we have in the fall is called Verge, and that is the climate tech event. And that's where we really highlight the innovations that make this happen. So we have food innovations. We have innovations in the carbon uh, removal space. We have innovations in, and I believe this year, one one of the tracks we'll be focusing on is water. Uh, I'm hopefully not pre-announcing anything, but I know that that's a, an interest that, uh, that, that we have. Of course, we have an energy, a very uh, active energy track, and then also transportation. How do you decarbonize transportation? So we have conferences within the conference, if you will, and then just sort of the broader issue of, of how technology can really accelerate the movement um, is, is something that we look at. So those are our, our physical events, ones that we do in person. We also have some virtual ones, uh, ones called Electrify. So really this very focused on electrification of buildings and, and other processes. Um, we have a uh, one called Net Zero, again, focused on the strategies around that, and then uh, uh, something that we're starting this year called Nature. So many companies are concerned about how their operations are affecting biodiversity, and so we're uh, getting deeper into that that space. Well, that's a great list of uh, different ways that people can find out more and get involved and participate. So that was terrific. Thank you. We've talked a little bit, we touched on the idea of you know, climate, uh, but there's other kinds of environmental disasters. And we saw one recently uh, mm -hmm. in East Palestine. And, you know, mm -hmm. you mentioned the younger generation. I have a 19-year-old son, and he's mentioned that, you know, basically every day since uh, since it happened. So I do hear what you're saying about the younger generation being more attuned, maybe, uh, to these sorts of things. But wonder, you know, some of your thoughts regarding the, the derailment there in East Palestine and what can individuals do to prevent future disasters such as that one? Are there things that can be done? Yeah, so you say individuals. I'm not sure what individuals can do, um, except to actually, you know what individuals can do? They can demand no, to know, right? So that horrible event um, has a lot of attention, partly because certain 
uh, news outlets have really made it their point of making it have a lot of attention. And I'm really actually very happy about that. But I'm also, um, but I'm not happy about the fact that there are hundreds of, of derailments like that a year. It, this happens way more than we, that the general public, and we're talking, spe- let's specifically talk about the United States because I can't really know about other, mm-hmm. I don't know about the other countries, but it happens a lot here. We have the right to know about that. We should know much more about that. So individuals can demand to know more and they can, I think that probably will come at the state level or the municipality level. But if you have a train uh, and, and you know a train system running through your town you should know what's on those trains you should you should understand it and and your your community should have the right to know that um i also think that the uh safety laws need to be much scrutinized a lot more um and you know i i don't want to get too political here but it, it's interesting how the environmental agency and the transportation safety agency suddenly now need to do more um when mm-hmm. Generally, it's been kind of, it's kind of ping pongs, right? It's like here we have these regulations. Oh no, no, we're going to get rid of all these things, and it ping pongs back and forth. Well, we need some sort of stability, right? So we need we need we need thoughtful safety regulations that are um, supportive of humans and not companies, right? With the humans need to be served. And then the other thing I will say is that the stu- you know the thing that I go back to is that the stuff on that train uh, was largely petro- there was a lot of petrochemicals there. So it, it also speaks to our need to get out of the petrochemical industry, to get rid of those materials and to find climate technologies that can replace them, biomaterials, bio, you know, safer alternatives that are not as toxic to humans or the yeah. environment or animals or, or everything, you know, just so it's kind of this multi uh, faceted way. So there's a lot of calls to action in that one. How reactive are you at Green Biz to your audience, you know, if hundreds of people, if hundreds of people are writing emails saying, "Hey, we want to see more coverage," whether it's about the derailment in East Palestine or or anything else, does that shape how you guys look at uh, editorial content? I would love to have that kind of guidance. Yeah, I mean, like absolutely. We we look at our analytics on a regular basis. We see, we know what people are reading. Um, you know, so we do look at that. But we absolutely we, we we have a small staff, right? We're not we're not staffed like the Washington Post or the New York Times or Bloomberg Green. Like we just don't have that many people. So we do need to focus. And I I know that in my mind, like I would like to do more on this particular incident that you're uh, speaking about. But the the way that I need to look at it is how this shows us a, a way of moving forward with other sort like I said, other sorts of chemicals. You know, how the right to know how corporations can work with their transportation partners to make sure that they're, you know, the, the, the people that had their products on that train should also have been, um, should also know how safe it is. Have, has that train, have the upgrades been made? Um, you know, it's, it sounds like, at least from the preliminary reports, that it was a very simple, small item that caused this. So we should know, we should know again, and they should know again. So the back to your question, though. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if if we had hundreds of people asking us to write something, we sure would. We sure would. You, you mentioned analytics as something that you guys look at. And, you know, 30 years ago, analytics in, in the media, probably if it existed at all, was very rudimentary. But looking forward into the future, what are some changes you feel you'll be seeing in the media or will maybe as consumers will be seeing as well in the media industry? Wow. <laughs> Um, I'm not a media analyst. So what changes? I think, I think you're going to see, uh, or honestly, a, a, a bit of a return to the basics. Um, I think that the, the sort of flap over greenwashing and the sort of the fact that these things keep happening and that, that the journalists have not been as accountable as they should have been with, with some of these climate things. I think you're going to see return to good old fashioned reporting and, accountability and focus on, you know, what's, what really matters. So that I do b- believe that that the pendulum is swinging back. Um, I think that local coverage is super important. That's not something I can personally be handling, but that, that does speak to each, each journalist has their own brand. So I'm, you know, in the process of trying to think what is my brand, you know, and how, how do I uh, keep that, that dialogue going with my, with my audience, regardless of whether I'm writing something or if I'm doing a podcast or, 
maybe I'm putting up a quick TikTok, I think that you'll see journalists stepping into their own brands more with all of the different platforms that we have. That's And again, as I said, I'm trying to sort that out for myself uh, right now, actually in the process of doing that for myself. But you know, there's no way I could write every story that I want to. However, I can be working on a long form piece and then I can pop onto LinkedIn or somewhere to make a comment about another thing. And then I can tweet out all the things that are related to that. And then I can maybe do a quick TikTok at the end of the week. And then, oh, by the way, if I visited a site, I can put a lot of photos up on my Instagram account. So I think that journalists, um, you know, are perpetuating the the dialogue in different ways. And that that's, that's one thing I think that will be changing. And I have no idea how <laughs> I'll have to watch and, and hopefully I'll participate in that. Yeah, but I, I think what I'm hearing is more touch points, which I think ultimately is a good thing. Uh, that that yeah. you know, yeah. journalists like yourself having that ability to get immediate feedback or to engage with readers, I think that's a, that, that's a positive trend. You know, but that you know, just one one thing. Uh, that being said, I don't think that journalists should only rely on that. They, 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 I mean, there's a lot to say about gut. If you think something is a story, then it probably is a story, even if you haven't heard it from anyone else yet. And I think that, you, that journalists also should trust their gut more. If something stinks, it probably, there's probably a reason it's rotting. It's probably rotting and you need to be checking it out. Right. Uh, let's wrap it up. I want to go back one more thing with Green Biz and talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, what I just noticed on your uh, Twitter account, that nominations for the 2023 Green Biz 30 under 30 list are now open. Wonder if you could tell our listeners a little bit about that particular project and um, maybe what you're looking for in candidates for the award. That's very happy you asked about that. And I hope this goes up quickly enough so that we have nominations based on this, uh, this interaction that we're having. So this is the eighth annual list. And what we are looking for is, as it sounds, rising professionals in the fields that I, I spoke about before in sustainability, in climate tech, in environmental justice, in circular economy design, things that have to do with the the climate tech and the climate action movement, if you will, the corporate climate action movement. And these individuals are, are under 30. So we're looking for people who are, you know, early in their career, but who have made some kind of notable commitment, uh, excuse me, some sort of notable achievement that, that is worth uh, uh, celebrating. And we, we really try to, to emphasize a cross section of diversity in, in all its forms uh, including regional diversity, like from the outside the United States, usually have a pretty good, um, uh, you know, maybe about 30 to 40 percent are from the outside of the United States. But, you know, the, our idea is to celebrate these uh, rising professionals who we can learn from and that who you all all our readers should be learning from as well. We've had 210 in the past, and I am really excited to name the, the next 30 and the nominations are open until 31st of March. So get them in. Uh, we, we, we usually have hundreds of them. I was peaking the other mm -hmm. day, and I, I know that we were well up over 100. It's going to be fun to go through them. But uh, I still engage regularly with the individuals from our past list. It's wonderful to see where they go for their careers. And they've, they've wound up in some, some pretty um, amazing places. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a gratifying uh, process. And I think, you know, that's a great way to wrap it up because we hit on a, a theme here, I think, over the course of the conversation about the younger generations and their engagement. And I think that award uh, is a perfect example of how you guys can, can salute and celebrate uh, those types of people. Absolutely. Heather, thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed our conversation. It's, it's great to hear from somebody on the media side and their perspective on things. So thank you for taking your time today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's been my pleasure. Well, that's all for this week's episode of Climb by VSC. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Special thanks to Credo for their help in producing and promoting this episode. To visit any part of today's conversation, again, you can find the full transcript on vscventures.com. Our thanks to Josue Ramiro for posting these every week. Lastly, if you've listened this far, please leave us a rating on Spotify or review on iTunes. It only takes a few seconds, really helps us out, and as far as I know, it's still carbon neutral. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you all next week on Climb by VSC.